Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 28 with Gary Kaneen, Carl Hooper and Harry Watling. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Uh, this week we've got a bit of a special for you. Uh, we've got three three guests, three and one, if you like, and we're going to be talking about uh, the 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 end of the player development cycle, talking about the youth youth development phase, uh, moving into the pro development phase. So you know all those issues about developing players towards the end of their development cycle as they before they go into the pro game. And we've got three fantastic guests, uh, three of the best about. Uh, first, we've got Gary uh, Kaneen, uh, so I'm sure you do know him uh, from his work on social media and the excellent Modern Soccer Coach a resource that I really do recommend. I use myself a lot. It's got great stuff on there like sessions and also obviously uh, he's a fantastic author as well. So many great books Gary's come out with. Uh, I have several myself. I really do encourage, encourage following Gary. Uh, he's got uh, he's a giant on social media. Also lots of quality experience as well most importantly. Obviously he's assistant coach at the Chicago Red Stars, um, a, we, a female pro team, and he's worked extensively in college soccer in America as well. So really that knowledge about uh, players towards the end of their development career and going into their pro pro career. So lots of great knowledge uh, to share. Uh, also got Harry Watling on the show this time. Uh, Harry, uh, we, uh, we met first met, we were both working at Chelsea in the foundation phase. Uh, he moved on to work at Millwall and actually since the recording of the show he's now working at West Ham. So as a young coach, lots of amazing experiences at three top academies, lots of knowledge to share, works all the way through working uh, with the older boys at Millwall and also now in his, in his, in his, new, uh, in his new role. And one of the, the best uh, young coaches about, real, you watch this space, he's got a big things expect of this guy. I know myself, he's a top quality coach. And also um, we've got Carl Hooper. Carl, I know from my time in academy football also, uh, he works at Birmingham City FC. He's worked his way up from the foundation phase, uh, now works with the youth team at Birmingham. So again, lots of great experience and knowledge to share. Really knows about the play de player development cycle, seeing it from the beginning to the end, which is really important, I think. So three fantastic guests who uh, have lots of knowledge to share. Uh, we did ask some questions. We put some, we've got some questions from social media and also from email, and we just turned into a general discussion. So this is a really good one. I really enjoy these sorts of shows because we're having three real specialists in the field and, and uh, attacking these, uh, these areas and a really interesting you know, uh, area about how do we get these players from uh, academy football or from development into the pro game. So I'm sure you are going to enjoy it. Remember, if you enjoy the show, please do leave a review. Um, it really is important. It has a lot of benefit. I really appreciate it. Uh, lots going on with, in the world of my personal football coach. Uh, so proud and privileged to welcome clubs from all around the world, from America, Canada, England, uh, Asia. Uh, welcome them into our club partnership program. Really privileged that they've chosen to, to add value to to their club and invest in the in the development of their players and their coaches with the my personal football coach club partnership so all the players get on the app uh, all the all the coaches get on the app as well really this is unique you know the only app in the world which is uh, a ball mastery program proven to be used at the pro level and the grassroots level and also all the coaches get access to the coaches pass and more importantly all the and the club get access to me uh, obviously my experience working in player development uh, not only at Chelsea and Tottenham for 10 years, but obviously at grassroots football. And uh, so really privileged getting those guys, all these clubs on board, lots of, more, lots of people coming from all around the world. So if you're interested in a club partnership, do, do get in touch. Uh, just uh, email uh, team at mypersonalfootballcoach.com and we can let you know how we can support your club and take your club to the next level. Uh, five to sevens program going from strength to strength. Really happy with that. One of the best programs uh, we've created, the five to seven year olds program. Lots of positive feedback. Uh, the coaches pass as well, going from strength to strength. If you don't know, the coaches pass, 
which is like the online resource for coaches. So not only we have like a library of ball mastery techniques, 1v1 skills, so you can upskill yourself. Also general techniques as well, all the techniques from soccer, but also uh, team sessions. So last few weeks we've had sessions from West Ham Academy coaches, Dynamo Zagreb. Uh, I'm going to continue traveling and bringing you uh, world-class sessions from all over the world. So that's going really well. A uh, busy couple of months in terms of travel. Looking forward to going to Spain next week and obviously in a couple of weeks and then back to Asia, to Thailand and Hong Kong. And then uh, I'm very excited to be presenting at the ISC conference in Geneva in December and also uh, back to uh, visiting the, uh, the big convention in the USA in Chicago. So if you want to touch base, uh, want to connect and network, uh, really, really uh, looking forward to meeting you guys. That would be great. But uh, without further ado, let's get into the show. This is a really good one. I know you're going to enjoy it. See you soon. So, uh, Harry, Gary, Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks all. Thanks all. So good to have you on. So, um, so we had some questions in from uh, some of the listeners. We'll go through the questions first. Obviously, we'll, we'll get all your opinions on it. And um, so, just bear, so first question is, uh, how how do you as coaches measure players' progress? Uh, so that question to you first, uh, Harry. Um, I think first and foremost, I understand, understand the players' potential, understand their journey, where they've been before, what they've been exposed to. Um, looking at performance is important during the game, during free play, to understand where they could be. They may be comfortable in one environment rather than another. Um, and then I think if you set realistic targets from where you are on day one to where you want to get to, you'll be able to measure a certain level of progress. But first thing you have to do is you have to understand the player. The other, the other side of the coin as well with that is so is you have to be able to obviously progress your delivery and what you're delivering. Because you, if you're... You're going to constantly deliver the same level and expose them to the same things. They may not progress at the same rate. So you've got to be conscious of what you're exposing them to as well. Uh, Gary, anything to add to that? Yeah, quite, quite similar. similar. I, mean, I think at, at the level I'm working at it, would probably be firstly to see where the player's at in their career, um, and then secondly, where they fit in the structure of what their role is in the team. Um, some are, at, I mean, if they're the back end of the squad or if they're one of the big players, and then the third would be to try and incorporate that there with, with the system of play in terms of giving them feedback after games or after after sessions, and and then trying to cater that kind of going. It all goes back then to the player and what way they want that, what want that feedback or want that information, whether they want as as simple stats or whether they want the video or whether they just want the chat and trying to. You're just constantly redefining and constantly trying to get every. Uh, the thing I'm learning is that every player kind of wants it packaged in different ways, um, and it's up to you to kind of be uh, aware of that. Some of them, and I just I just view it by engagement, um, and and constantly trying to see whether you're you're hitting the right level of engagement or or whether you're off and you need to you need to go back and reevaluate what you're doing. Um, what's the difference then, Gary, between obviously? With your previous role working in college, and then now obviously you're with the pro ge- game in the women's game, what is there any differences in in that in terms of what you're doing then in how you're how you uh, you're, you're measuring the players' progress? Yeah, yeah. In college, the challenge was the game structure. There wasn't enough games, and when the games did come, they were they came thick and fast. Um, so you know, pre-game, post-game, I, I was I was quite frustrated. That we couldn't get enough work in, and now at the pro level, the, the season stretched. Obviously, you have more access than the soccer side, so you can do a little bit more. So, in terms of you know getting that post game now, instead of college, it lasted a morning almost, and now you can kind of stretch that out to two or three days. So you can do a little bit more. You can have more meetings. You can meet with units, uh, which I, I enjoy a little bit more because you can you can go into you know more detail, and then on the on the pre game. You can go into more scouting, opposition analysis, and how your performance is going to be gauged against a certain player. So, yeah, and, and with the level of player, I find that the, the pro player uh, want they just want detail, um, and they you know they they don't they I think at the college player that I was used to, you could tell them you know any, any they were just happy to get some form of feedback. They just nod and say this is great. He's talking to me. Whereas a, a pro player. Um, if it's not if it's not what they need, they'll just completely disengage. And Carl, what about yourself? 
Yeah, I, I think I'd have to agree with that. It's, it's knowing the individual, where they've come from, obviously where they're at at the moment, whether that might be maturation, that might be a late developer or an early developer. And then I think now with my role primarily in the professional development phase, it's, it's knowing what they've got to get to in terms of what the first team manager's going to want from them or what level they've got to reach in order to get in to the 23 squad or, or to get somebody want, to want to take them on loan. So I think it's really constantly evaluating where they're at really and, and not getting too emotional with it because I think there'll be peaks and troughs with everyone's development and it's, it, it is not linear that no two paths are going to be the same. I think it's constantly gathering as much information as we can from all the multi-disciplines within the building to help us really forge that information of where we think they are and plotting their progress against where they are as an individual. I mean, you've had the experience, you've, you've been fortunate enough to work in the foundation phase all the way up to to the pro phase now. Uh, Carl, what, what, what would you, how, has, how has that progressed that in your journey, that the way you're measuring players particularly? Yeah, I think it, I think it's helped me now. I think if I was to go back to the foundation phase, I might be a little bit of a different coach in the foundation phase for what I now know from working in the professional development phase and probably seeing more in around first team football. Um, but ultimately, I think in, in any phase, it, it's, it's about individuals, even all the way through to first team. I think it's about really knowing, engaging that individual and connecting with the individuals to, to help maximise their development at the time. Um, and then, like I said, the, the requirements will probably be a little bit different as they get closer to the end in terms of the professional development phase. It has to have a bit more start realisation of what they need to do now to get a career in the game in first team football and hold down a career. So you might have to start taking a little bit more of a, a pragmatic approach towards the end than you do at the beginning of their, their, their development because ultimately you want to get as many players' careers in the game as you can. So I mean, on the same lines, the sec- this, that's questions from Dor Paldi uh, from Twitter. He has a second part of the question asking, how much do you interact one-on-one with players? It's something I'm quite interested in as well. Obviously, you guys know I do individual coaching. So, H, how much time do you get to, what, you know, working with the 15s and 16s at Millwall? How much one-on-one time do you get with the players? How much? How can you really can you really get time to affect the individual? I think, to be honest with you, so I think training, just just training, working with players, rehearsing in general, needs to be more personal across the board um, to the individual. So even if you're talking about speaking with units or speaking with a whole group, or you are just talking about the one isolated individual, conversations for me need to be about how you use and choose your relationships within the team. Um, so it can be based around anything. It can be based around the player's personal identity within the team or as... Carl just referring to, which was a really good point, what they actually need, what are their key essentials to get them over the line for that next phase in their career. And I think that the more one-to-one interaction you have within a, within a practice or within a, those moments that you're trying to rehearse, you will get the best out of those players. I, I just think that everybody is opening their mind now more and more to speaking more about the individual within the moment more than it being too teamy, um, if that's fair to say. So I'm, I will try and speak a hell of a lot to individuals, speak about the small-sided game that they will have within the game and how they feel within those moments and then try and get the best out of those individuals within those moments. I suppose it's about managing your time, right? And I suppose, you know, you, how much time do you get with the players? How much opportunities do you get to actually interact with them? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I think. I think it's it's very it's very difficult to um, to give everybody an absolute equal amount of your time. But I think as long as you're conscious of what you're actually trying to do every time you sort of you know you step onto the pitch or every time there's a drink break or every time you get that little moment with the player beforehand, if you want to just sow a seed, if you're conscious of those things that you're doing. Um, and the players sometimes will be conscious of that as well and they'll appreciate that a lot more. You get that buy-in, what the guys were talking about earlier. So, and Carl, what about you now? So you're working with the, uh, the older boys. How much in one-on-one time do you get with those? So those guys are full-time. Does that make it easier to get, get one-on-one with them? Yeah, I think, I think it makes it easier, but then again, you've still got a lot of players to do. It's about being intelligent with how you use your time to make sure that you're still giving every individual what they need. Obviously, it's far easier in the professional development phase because we've probably got more staff per player ranging from the physios, the sports scientists, the analysts, to the coaches. So I think between us 
and, and good planning, we can we can probably share that time and make sure a lot of individuals get infected each day and, and each week. And then I think it's, it's been clever and buying into to the modern culture as well. The, the kids are and the lads are going to be on their phones and whatnot. So we almost break our analysis when we do our analysis down into three codes. We'll have player-led ones where they'll come back and present to us as coaches, whether that's in groups, or units or as individuals. We'll have the coach-led ones where it might be where we're breaking it down for the individuals, units and the team. And then I'll, I'll, I'll mass on, on the informal ones, so it might be, for example, I'm working on a, a player who's working on receiving through the lines. And I might see some great clips of Modric doing it that night, or it might be our first team doing that night. I don't think there's any harm in, in WhatsApping that over to them on the evening when they're sitting at home on their own cage and saying, what do you think about this from a farming tomorrow to have two minutes? I think it's just being intelligent with your time and also using the media that we've got today to help us. And obviously, the, a lot of the children buy into that, and a lot of the young people buy into that now. So it's, it's just being really intelligent with your time and sharing the load across all the staff and all the people to positively affect everyone, really. And Gary, obviously, now you, you're working in, in, the, in the pro game, you've got professional women players. What's that, what's that like in terms of, you know, you trying to get one-to-one time with those players and, and how do they react? Now, obviously, this, the environment's different. They're getting paid. I mean, is that any different to when it was what you were like at college? Yeah, I think just the environment is, is the type of feedback. Um, we, we had a, a, a team builder's performance specialist, him, Donna Fisher, within college that was that was almost trying to sell feedback to kids. And she was she just used a catchphrase that feast on feedback. And she was trying to sell it, you know, that you want it and too many players at the lower level see feedback as criticism so they kind of stay away from it because that's what they've always been used to. Whereas I think the older or the, the experienced, the professional players just want feedback at all times because um, they see it as anything to improve their game. But just going back to Carr's point, I think that informal piece is huge. I think just being able to walk off a field with a player and being able to give them, um, you know, thirty seconds of of content, but then it's the challenge at the pro level, making sure that content that there's substance, that there's meat on the bone. Because if you're walking off and just giving a generalisation, I think the challenge is as coaches that then the player susses that out, and they just don't want empty compliments. Um, so that's that's what I enjoy. I enjoy having to watch a session and being like, well. If I walk off with this player, I've got to be able to give them something. Um, otherwise, I, you know, I'm, I'm wasting my. There's no point in talking about the weather, and, and they don't want that either. I mean, well, I mean, I'm interested though. How do they, how do they respond? I mean, if you're giving someone constructive criticism, for instance, uh, you know, say fullbacks made a mistake or something, are they all always open? I mean, I imagine some there, there's different reactions, and some people might be a bit more hostile to it. Well, at the at the level that I've experienced that uh, they'll challenge the situation. So I would never, you know, I'm, I'm pretty careful about what I, if it's feedback in terms of, like, if it can be, if it can be interpreted as criticism, I've got to make sure I'm not, I'm not criticizing or not pinpointing a technical error. I want to get the decision all the time because a technical error, sometimes it goes, sometimes it doesn't. Seven out of 10, eight out of 10. But if it's a decision maker in the, in the, in the system, I want to try and nail it, and then that that usually brings a conversation of they'll say, well, that's this is what I saw, and then that's why I, I would always if it, if I'm going down that road, I want to make sure that I've got video on my side. So that's what that's where I've kind of taken my role is if, if and if that brings a conversation, then even better. And I find that the the more the more Two way the common, the more you can get to a dialogue where the, you can see what they saw and you can kind of get a feel of how they see the game, I find that there then strengthens the relationship because it allows you then to see it from their point of view. Um, and when you do that, if a, if a one minute, 30 second conversation can turn into a, a 15 minute conversation with the help of video, I think you're only strengthening that connection with you and the player and the player and how you see the game and they see the game. Interesting. So, uh, so another question here is from Harvey Miller. He's a young English coach out in the States. Uh, when players enter the uh, your age range, what player KPIs do you have technically, tactically, psychologically and physically? Carl, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I, I think again, I think that's hard because I think it can be too generic. 
And I, I think it's almost got to be have they got an out and out strength? So whether it's in one of those those four areas. So we might have a boy who's sixteen and we offer a scholarship to and we know he's got the physical to come. We know he's gonna keep developing mentally, but he might be outstanding technically, so that might be an area or KPI of why he's got in. And then you might have someone on a different um barometer to that than that to speak that they might have come into the system late, but they're outstanding outstanding athletically and we've got to really work hard one on one and, and the work we do is to develop them develop them technically. So I think you've almost got to have a, a KPI for each player. I think the one that is a necessity for anyone is that you've got to see that mental attitude, that love for the game and that desire to want to improve individually. I think if you're not showing that as a under sixteen, then you might be struggling to get a scholarship offer at our club or or another club. I think people have got to seek that want and that desire to keep improving in all four corners. What 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 stage do you maybe say you talked about maybe a player having the athleticism, not having the technical quality, what stage do they, you know, does that become too much of an issue? When does that trade-off have to stop? I mean, what what point? I think if, if you just see it as like a jigsaw puzzle as they get older, they've got to start putting more pieces in place. So for example, if someone was excellent physically and they're reading the game was good, but he might be breaking down on, on certain technical areas, that then might convince you to keep them because they might have more pieces in place. They might be a great leader. I think it's when there's, there's too many pieces missing that you don't think you're going to have the time to... To fill those in, really, yeah, as they get older. You still, you, would you still take them projects on it in the under 18s, for example? Those players who are technically not not that good, but they obviously they're uh, they've got them as leaders, or they're physically. I mean, you still, you still. I, I, I think it's a balance. That, that wouldn't be the only prerequisite for us to take one on. But I think if you saw something in a player, then we would. And I think it depends on on each club. We we're at a club where we really have to develop players and keep working and, and keep working with players. We won't always have a finished article where other clubs might have the, the opportunity to go and invest a lot of money to go and purchase people that have, have potentially more of a finished article. Whereas I think we would take the risk on players that we we can see some long-term development in them. Because again, players are making a debut a little bit later now. And I think there's a long time if they've got to up to under 23 level now really to keep honing and developing the game. Uh, what about you, H, Harry? So, I mean, obviously you, like myself, worked at Chelsea where uh, there was a, maybe a lot, there was a little less patience than maybe what your club you're at at the moment, Millwall, because the level is so high. Uh, what do you think about that? You know, those trade-offs you've got to make and having a bit more patience with players? Yeah, I, I, I think Carl's spot on the first few things he said, really. I think it should be different for every player and nothing should be generic. Um, I also think that when you're setting these, these, uh, when you're looking at players and what their, you know, what their super strengths are, I think it's really important to to, to understand that a player will be 99% of the time he will be signed on what he's outstanding at rather than what he's not very good at. So I think it's important that we look at players' super strengths and what their, what the ingredients are that they're going to need to get to the next level. What we said earlier, I think we've also got to be mindful that when we're challenging these players. Um, that it impacts each corner. So an example that I will give you is um, I inherited a player at under 13 who was <clears throat> played who played the majority of his football centrally up until that point, but couldn't really travel with the ball. He was an outstanding receiver and a very good releaser, but couldn't travel with the ball. So a couple of periods on you know on the odd week, it was planned within the staff um, and spoken to, to the rest of his peers about him not being able to either play backwards or release the ball in certain areas of the pitch to almost force him to travel with it. Now, how would that impact his tactical understanding? How would that impact him psychologically when he's not successful? We had to be really mindful of those things. Um, <coughs> he's come out the other side a very, very competent travelling with the ball now, down to those things. But I think when you're looking at initially... Looking at players and saying what they're good at, where are they strong, where are their super strengths, where do they need to be maybe rounded off and improved. You have to always understand that with every challenge, it's going to impact maybe somewhere tactically, maybe even potentially technically, physically, psychologically. Um, different clubs will have different expectations of the players. You look at, you would talk about performance now versus potential later. You would have to look at where they are on their maturation curve. You'd have to take all of these things into account. And like you just said, Saul, 
some clubs you will have lots of patience and they'll they'll, they'll have the um, they'll have the foresight to see that later on down the line this young man will be able to improve those technical attributes to couple with his physical ability. Um, whereas others may not be so patient with with those those type of things. So I really think that again just to to, to go on what Carl said, it, it has to be different for every player and, and nothing should be generic and there's got to be a, a deep thought process that goes in when we're looking at these things that we're putting in place for these players. And uh, Gary, what about yourself? Yeah, I completely agree and I think as coaches, uh, we're just, we all want to systemize everything, you know, we all want to systemize a, a structure in place so we can, I, I don't know, develop a way of managing things but the art of creating players that are a little bit different, or as as Harry said, there, you know, accentuating their strengths, would involve just <laughs> just adapting constantly to where they are. I don't feel there's enough checkpoints in the in the youth development stage over here to where we are looking at, you know, maximizing those strengths. You know, I think it's it's too much. End of season evaluation, end of season evaluation, start of season, set goals, team goals, and it doesn't really develop players. So, you know, it's constantly being able to, and then the awareness, we're trying, to, we're trying to increase awareness from players to improve and develop, but yeah, what's our awareness like as coaches in that development phase? And for me, it's, it's not good enough um, to try and tailor it to the individual. In my experience, what I've seen over here, it's quite interesting. I've actually, I think that is, I've always had this opinion as well. I think the struggle, whether we're struggling with, um, whether we're, we're struggling with the infrastructure to deal with it, I, I'm not sure whether we get enough one-on-one time with the, to support players. For instance, you're talking about, you know, in my experience in clubs, players might say, right, for instance, they've got movement issues. Are we doing enough to support those players' movement issues before they get released, or same technical issues, or you know, when they get their reports? What's, you know, do you think? Do you think that we 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 get given opportunity enough to players to really support them to 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 have to iron out these problems before they get released? Carl, do you want to start with that one? Um, and again, I think I think it would depend on the club and like we keep saying the word patience. I know for our club, for example, we we've had a lot of success recently in players getting into the first team that have been released from other, other clubs. So maybe the patience might not have been there, or they didn't see the potential in them and then again I think it's down to the coach again how, how good do you want to be and how good do you want your staff in and around you to be to find the time to fit that individual practice in and to fit the individual analysis or whatever that individual needs at the time um, and I think the hardest bit with everything is there's, there's only 24 hours in a day so you have to be rigorous with your planning to ensure that you're really meeting the needs of, of all the players because it's very rare that you're going to get a finished article at 16, 17. So you've got to keep working, and that's working on the grass, working off the pitch, and it's really being rigorous with your plan to make sure you're catering for each and every individual player's needs, really. H, have you got any thoughts on that? No, I think I've pretty much covered it really there. So I think, you know, we've probably touched on the answer to this question over the course of this conversation already about just making sure that it's personal to each individual player and that we are we are trying to have as many sort of thought provoking conversations off the pitch in and around staff utilising all the uh, facilities that we have, the staff that we have and the ideas that we bring to the table for the best of the players. But I mean what's what are the main contrasts you mean you've worked at Chelsea and then Millwall, obviously two different clubs in terms of uh, you know, structure and support mechanism. What's the main difference between what you find in Millwall now, you know, working in that environment? Um, I would say that it, it, it will also be different as well because obviously when I was at Chelsea, I was working from 9 to, nine to 11, but Millwall has been 12 to 16. But I think there's a little bit more freedom um, at Millwall and the players, I feel like the players appreciate that. Um, yes, we still liaise with all scientists because I know that they can be temperamental that the amount of time we have to play on the pitch nowadays, but the Thank players for that one. <laughs> <laughs> the players, the players will, will, um, will they'll get in a little bit earlier. Um, we we try and give them sort of thirty minutes on a say, for example, on a Tuesday and one other time a week. Um, we call them individual development plans, but we will try and revisit those sort of every six to eight weeks, and I'm sure most clubs do. Um, 
and speak about sort of what key ingredients do you need to add to your game at this moment in time to take you to the next level? What is going to make you different to maybe the lad above you in the age group above you? What is going to what is going to give you a personality on the pitch that stands out? Um, so we give those, we give them that amount of time and that play on them. Um, coaches are, are more than you know more than happy to, to jump in with them, but that's player led. And what we try and do is we try and uh, bounce them off of each other. So if, for example, one of our fullbacks has got some movement issues with his feet, and um, we want one of our wide players to work on his one v one domination, perfect, links in perfectly. You two go over there, have 25 minutes, come up with some practices yourselves. If, for example, you want one of your centre halves to go and attack attack across and then your opposite centre half you want to want him to work on his weaker foot deliveries into the deep part of the pitch. Again, perfect. Go and team up together, work together. So again, it all comes back to us um, being creative, being imaginative and, and trying to put the best things in place for the players. Interesting. So before moving on then, just takes us on nicely to the next question. I mean uh, one of the old questions, I mean technical v tactical. I mean, how 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 do you uh, how much is your work is tactical? How much of your work is technical? What about you, Gary? I mean, now you're working there at the top end with the the uh, with the pros. How much is it is technical? How much is tactical? Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's that balance as well. And I suppose personally, as a coach, I moved in my journey. I I towards in college, I went more tactical, um, and then I think it t- took away a little bit of my strengths as a coach. Um, and I, were, I want to move more to the side of the individual. I want to move more to the side of the of how to get them to, again, stand out in games because almost I, I found myself just looking for the, you know, the, the average, basically. And I think as we go for systems and we, and we talk about systems, we look for players that fit in systems rather than stand out or look for something different. But if you watch the – we're all watching Brazil here, like it's – Something magic is going is to open up one of these games, so you have to accommodate for that in your coaching as well. I don't know if I've answered that. That's just where I am as a coach. I suppose it's the tricky thing is that you know, for you, you know, how much how can you you know you're working at the top end? How much can you improve players that that you know when they come to you? Are they the, are they the finished article or are there are there is there room to to improve? Yeah, well, the biggest I think the biggest area for growth is. Is on is tactical understanding, and you know, and I think that's what the players want. I think technically in the U.S. we you know we, we complain about we complain about the technical ability of players over here, but when you watch them warm up and you watch a, a pattern, a passing pattern, it just it, it's just top class. But when you put a decision making variable inside it, it just drops uh, significantly. So it's the ability to to make the, to think to think your player. Um, how do you improve a thinking player? And it's, it's just you try and educate them a little bit more in the game tactically, and try to see where they stand in it. Uh, you know, it's such a good. I could go on for all day here. It's just over here. I feel that we've we've just reached the, the the growth of the player has almost outgrown the growth of the coach, and and a coaches we're not growing at the same speed that the players are growing. So you watch the game the World Cup is so like, I'm enjoying the World Cup because it's so tactical but I do, you know we want our players to watch more soccer but they don't watch it through the same lens as we do because we're not giving them information uh, at the same speed that they need it so I just feel that the coaching needs to improve as well and our, we're not having tactical conversations that relate to the game we're not going to improve either I think it's quite interesting so obviously I, I work with a lot of young pros um, who want to work on tech particular elements of the game so I'm just interested you know you at the pro do you mean if you're having a if you're having a for instance you know a wide player who's who's struggling in a 1v1 or struggling you know with delivery or something like that do you do you, do you really try and take them out of the game a bit and say like look let's work on these issues yeah for most of them and I don't know why this is just me most of them are are, are attacking you know you know you're cutting inside and, and just having something in your game especially the younger players the ro- rookies that it's their first year as a pro, they come from the college side, and, and what got them a yard or two before the, at the college level was was athleticism, and now it's got to be you know finding a bit of maybe it's finding a, a yard or two of space, or maybe it's improving that technical quality when you do get the yard. 
um, you're only getting a couple of chances, whereas in college you're getting 10 opportunities to cut inside, and at pro level you're only getting one, so you've got to be able to refine that there. So, yeah, it's all, I find that, again, maybe it's just me, I find that the areas that I'm looking to improve technically are all attacking areas, whereas the American player is physically that good that in almost the defensive side, it, it, it's almost easier. Yeah, and what about, H, what about you? Do you working with these 15 and 16 year olds at Millwall? You know, some of the best young players around. I mean, how much time do you spend on them technically uh, compared to tactically? You know what, so I think I may not be alone in saying this statement. I think what, what normally tends to happen is if you go through the age groups, start off just, just speaking about technical development, and then as a young English coach, I went and started working with 13s and 14s, and I automatically assume that I'd have to be tactically outstanding, otherwise I wouldn't be able to cope. So what you do is you almost get submerged in that, and you almost get lost in that for a small period of time, and then you start coming back round again to the full processes of, well, we probably need to rehearse these scenarios because our plans need to be technically better. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that you always have to take someone away from a session and away from a group session in order to get um, good technical practice out. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a bad thing to do it, but I think if you're creative with how a, how a practice starts or some challenges within the practice or some restrictions on how someone may play within a certain area, then you can get both your te- technical and your tactical out. Um, I think it's a process, and I think Gary was talking about the process you go through and the journey you go through personally as a coach. Everyone will go through it at different times. Um, and it, again, it goes back to just having that, having that balance. And now I'm at that stage where I, I'm comfortable tactically to speak about systems, uh, on, on, on how to set out a team in a certain way, etc. I'm more comfortable within myself as a person speaking about moments within the game and getting into scenarios where, yes, you need to execute something. How do you feel when you are doing that? And what does that moment look like? What does that moment feel like? How does it happen? What can be the repercussions of different um, different ways you can finish off? So, again, I agree with the guy that it's all about having that balance. And, Carl, what about yourself? What would you, how would you say you... Uh split your, your training up technically be tactically at, at now working with the 18s yeah again I think just, just having that extra time and then being in all the time it allows us to get closer to getting the right balance and that I think you need to ensure that continual technical work is happening and I think if you can marry that up with some tactical information so just like you said there if you've got someone who's not great at running off the shoulder can you put sessions on with running off the shoulder where you've got a technical finish at the end and then ideally then it's leading into a game where the game's got enough room and enough space that you can keep practicing that throughout the session. Um, and like I said, I think it's, it's really getting that balance in the match because as they get close to the first thing, we've got to make sure that they understand their roles and responsibilities when they cross that white line to go and win three points for the first team. So we have to make sure they have the relevant technical and tactical attributes to, to fill the position that they might play in. Um, one that I find is everyone keeps talking about technique. And it's always, he's on the attacking sense in this country. I find that there's a lot of poor defensive technique goes on. So I still think there has to be work on that when you watch some of the players abroad and, and their ability to block and shift their feet to block, their ability to, to head the ball um, and then their ability to tackle properly. So I still think we've got to ensure that we put technical sessions on to improve those areas. Because, for example, I might have a right back in, in our eight teams. If he can't take the right position up one to defend his back post but then they can't head at the back post it's unlikely that he's going to get into our first team at the minute do you think Carl that this is going a bit off topic well just to come around the ads a bit but do you think that there's, there's big talk now I saw there was an article in the the paper about A.D. Boothroyd saying there's a real shortage of uh, quality defenders coming up obviously we've got some of the best young attacking players in in world football but there's a real shortage of good quality uh, defenders in the academy game, do you think that's a result of? Uh, well, what do you think that? Why do you think that is? Do you think maybe it's a result of uh, the way that academy football now is all? Maybe that everyone is trying to play football, maybe you know a certain way, or why do you think there's there's not that wealth of defenders anymore? I think yeah, I think it is. I think we've probably gone one complete opposite to the to the spectrum where we was. Obviously, we all renowned for producing great centre halves, and if you look back to 
between 98, 2002, 2004, centre-arse, we had our disposable, we're outstanding defenders, could they have been better on the board? I don't know. Um, but yeah, and I think it will be a lot of the gang stars, there's a lot of possession-based football in academy football, so you might not be able to get as many blocks on in and around the box, you might not have to deal with as many crosses, you might not be as much direct play with balls going in behind you. So I still think we've got to get the right balance, and I think that's the same with strikers at the same time. So I still think we've got to have those strikers like Mike Bowen would have done in terms of running behind in behind defenders and ensuring we've got players that can be poachers at the same time. So I think it's just striking that balance between possession and, and technical passing attributes to also all game types and all training types and scenarios so that people are constantly practising what the, the real game looks like. So I watched the Uruguay the game the other day and the amount of blocks Godin got on, for example was outstanding and he does it week in, week out in the Champions League. He must have practised that as a youth at the same time. So we've got to make sure that we're practising everything that's relevant to the game for, for every player, really. What about you, H? Do you think that is a result of the, the uh, shortage of defenders as a result of the way we're playing or maybe is it the recruitment? What's your thoughts? Well, my personal favourite is, I think, it's two points. So first of all, I think the way we've been coach-educated is to um, almost... Stop the session, talk about why a scenario has happened, and stop that scenario from happening rather than coaching the emergency defending aspect of it. So a ball will go in behind, and we will say, Okay, just relax there. I want to speak about why there wasn't enough pressure on the ball, what your depth was like as a back line, rather than maybe allowing it to go and see how the see how the lad or the young lady actually defends that moment. I think that's really important that we speak more about allowing emergency defending to happen so the players understand on what it feels like to hurt your body, what it feels like to get blocked in and tackled. The other thing is I think the, the style of play has changed in England considerably um, to the point where we will try and mix our game programme up so that our centre half may, may have to go and... If we go and play against some grassroots sides, as an example, um, our centre half are going to go and have to head the ball 20, 30 times a half, which is it's a key ingredient of being a centre-back. You've got to be able to head the football. You've got to be able to judge the flight of the ball and sort your feet out in order to get in line with it. So that's really important. I think that in order to improve that, we should maybe mix our game programmes up a little bit more. And again, like I just touched on, I think that we need to probably subscribe more to the idea of allowing, allowing practices to and allowing games to continue maybe three, four, five seconds longer and then speak about the emergency defending aspect rather than just sort of talking about preventing those moments from happening, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And what about you, Gary? Also, you're working at, at the top end where actually, you know, when you make a defensive area, it actually has a big uh, impact. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the one on emergency defense, like that's brilliant, real brilliant point. Um, just in the US culture, I think that we've been swept up in a way of a possession football and we've all almost, you know, I think the, the way coaches perceive the game and see the game, I just, I think matters a lot in how we develop players. So when I, even how I, Iceland are perceived, it's almost a, apologetic in how they play. You know, everyone's sweet and well enjoyed. I, I wouldn't play that way myself, but I enjoy the way Iceland fight for each other. And it, you just... You can't have a defensive mentality without without being a you know, defensive shape and taking a pride in it. But it's almost that people don't want to say over here that you know I take pride in the defensive side of the game. So I find that that there is you know I think we need to get back to having session design, allowing people to you know if if we watch a session and a, and a game you know small side game finishes fourteen thirteen. We're just walking away thinking that was great attacking football, whereas we should be disgusted with some of the defending that takes place. We should just maybe lift our standards towards that there and take a bit more pride in it because that's when you get to the top level, that's what you spend most of your time talking about in the, in the preparation for the games is your defensive shape and how you're going to recover when you lose it. Interesting. So on to, nice, nicely to our next point, talking about training and the, the, uh, the age-old debate about opposed or unopposed, where and when. Uh, starting with your Garrett, Gary, what's your thoughts on the opposed or unopposed debate? Yeah, 
I mean, I don't work at the youth development for I'm 10, 15 years since I was, so I wouldn't be a, an expert by any means at the at the lower level. But you know, I would say that when we're developing players, there's there's no point in going into uh, an opposed game and and trying to put principles in place whenever they don't have mastery of the football. And master the football takes place without. I mean, we all did it informally growing up with a wall or with a frame, just just playing unopposed. So I don't see that everything has to be opposed. And even at this level, you know, even whenever we're 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 going for a session, and when you're when you're trying to get a session, the players need to get that almost that mental comfortability in the ball before they're they're comfortable going and and tackling each other and playing with aggression. So those passive patterns. You know, people say the passive patterns don't transfer 100% of the game, but the principle of the pattern does, if it's coming from ball back to off the centre forward, switch a play, you know, and it's always just a mental rehearsal to, to the principle. I, I just think that's needed at every level. So it's, you know, as everything, it's a balance, but yeah, I think there's definitely a place for unopposed uh, practices. I heard a good term, uh, Lee Heron, you know, you know as well, the... Uh, ex Red, yeah. Reading Academy manager now Arsenal uh, works at Arsenal. He used the term technical grooving, which I really liked. Uh, so I saw these ice hockey players warming up um, before the NHL game, just doing work with the puck. And especially, I'm working with the older players as well. I work with young pros. That just that time on the ball just makes them more confident on the ball. Whether you're a newcomer or a, a pro, surely that's uh, that's what it's all about, right? Gary, yeah, for sure, for sure, and that's where. You know, I think we're, uh, there's a goal. We, you know, we say that that's not, you know, that at the pro level that they've got to be, you know, that they're more technically efficient and they can do things automatically. But again, if how did they get there? You know, and, and you look at you watch Brazil here, and and the, the, you know everything they're trying to problem solve. Their heads are up all the time, and just little things that you know you watch an under fourteen game over here, and the heads are down all the time. So every pass is going five, ten yards rather than they can't see ahead of the game. So, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's constant rehearsal, and they're, they're unwilling to try things or be creative because we're not giving them the space to do it so much as it. And, uh, Harry, what's your thoughts on this, on the, te- the opposed on opposed debate? Um, a little bit of both. <laughs> um, I, I think when you're working with players on opposed, it's definitely building confidence on the ball for them to, to express a little bit more. Um, and yes, it will improve their confidence. Yes, it will improve them, them technically. Um, then again, at the same time, putting them, throwing them in, a, in an opposed environment will also force things out of them, force more random movements out of them than what an unopposed environment would. So I just think you've just got to have a good balance of both. Um, and I think you've got to be clever. Is it just going to be pure, isolated technique, or are you going to maybe make it a little bit more random? Um, it's entirely, again, it's entirely up to the thought process behind the coach and what they want to get out of it. I think ultimately we are all building up to the same thing. We're all building up to the game. Um, and, and how people get there will, will vary at all different levels. Um, but I think the confidence and the psychological side of the unopposed technique, to the unopposed technical work, the, the confidence side of it is, is a massive, massive, massive thing. Well, well, I mean, how much do you do of that at Millwall then? How much unopposed work would you do at Millwall with the 15s and 16s in a week, for instance? Uh, in a week, I would say maybe 25%. Um, something, something along those lines. Uh, again, all dependent on, on what we're doing. So, so it, it may be that we may we may be rehearsed. I might may be working with my fullback, just re- rehearsing on how they're going to get into areas to deliver the football, what areas they're going to deliver the football into. Um, but then again, you will break that into, after a while, it will go into some form of opposition work. And then you build from there. So I would say between sort of 20 and 30% a week. Interesting. And Carl, what about you at, at Birmingham? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, and again, it's got to be that balance. I, I think it's a little bit because I think the players just develop without practicing with the ball from just playing games. I think the games pivotal are definitely the most important in terms of developing decision makers and, and that is the end point. But you have to keep refining techniques. And again I've got the Brazil game on in the background at the minute. And the variety of techniques that you need to play the game of football, from dribbling to receiving off all different surfaces of different body areas. There's an endless amount of techniques and skills that you can practice. So I think you have to practice them on the post 
and then take them into a skill-based scenario. I think any sport is very similar. It's like I'm a big boxing fan, so I go and watch and try to get down to a lot of professional boxing gyms, and they're on the pads constantly refining whether it's a left hook or a combination. I don't see how that's any different. And then they'll get in the ring and they'll spar, which is obviously where the pivotal learning and decision-making takes place of, of when to throw that punch or when to move back so that you avoid the punch. I think it's very similar in a lot of sports, but you have to practice and find those techniques. And then De Bruyne has passed the other day, for example, um, that settled the cap his head out. I don't think he makes that unless he practiced that endless times on his own or unopposed, because the technique to de- deliver it at that quality and such pressure, he must have practiced it over and over again, and then he must have rehearsed it in game-based scenarios with pressure on him. I think it's, it, it's the balance and, and making sure you just keep practicing and refining your game all the time. I suppose, yeah, that's the key, isn't it? It's uh, where and when, and is that the most effective use of your time and how much time you've got? You guys, lucky you're working full-time, you've got the players for an awful lot of time, so you maybe have more time to to work with them in that environment where if you, you're a coach, you've got them one hour a week. Is that, you know, really effective use of your time doing that? I suppose that, is that, what are your thoughts on that, Gary? Yeah, I was just going to say, we have a we have a, a Japanese international World Cup winner. She's... She's in her 30s now, so she's at the latter stage of her game, and she's played with Chelsea, she's played in Germany, um, different class, and she, we do a movement. Our, our practice, our, our training pitch is probably about 500 yards from our facility that they do their pre-game prep or pre-practice movement prep and all that good stuff. She gets out 15 minutes before anyone else and works constantly with her ball and then she finishes when the session finishes she does 15 20 minutes on her own in front of the goal and sometimes we stereotype the brazilians and the japanese as all oh, that you know she just does that because she's from a technical culture but she finds time and i use it for the younger players she finds time where other players are, are swept up in social you know chatting or they're coming off the pitch at the end and they just want to get a drink and she finds that 15 so she extends her her daily work an extra 35 minutes and over a course of a week that's two and a half hours course of the season etc etc and it just if, if that if i was against on a post training before seeing her i would have changed my mind by now she just she she is a is a case study every day to the power of it i mean yeah listen if if you know, when I mean H and I for enough lucky enough to work at to at Chelsea, seeing and obviously I was at Spurs and obviously you know Carl Berman and Milne. When you see the pros, they're all doing this work. You know the top top players are all working away from the game. It's it's, uh, it's a ritual. So I think it's really important to try and instill that in our coaches and young players as well. But anyway, moving on because I know we've got pressed for time. Uh, just uh, want to talk about. Um, uh, in, uh, we had a, a, a great and interesting interview with Adi Vivash, who's previously at Chelsea, uh, now as a Coventry assistant manager. And he was talking about the the, um, the tactical uh, level, obviously at the highest level, and about uh, and then making changes within games. So the next question is, is like, um, what are the demands, the tactical demands at the level you're working at? And obviously, you know, you've all worked at younger ages. And uh, can you give us an example of some sort of, you know, some tactical mid-game changes you've had to make, and you know, and and how you've made them. Um, Cole, do you want to go first with this one? Yeah, I think I think it's a real balancing act in terms of with the 18s football. I think the league games in particular, a lot of the change that we'd look to make would be to how we can influence the players, get on the ball more. So whether that is, is changing formation, changing personnel, change positions. It might be how it can really positively affect certain individuals or them on the defensive side, how it might be exposed somebody more, what they want, if, if, they, if they've got to develop that area. Whereas, for example, this year in the Youth Cup, um, the Youth Cup, when we set out our stores, it was winnable cost virtually in terms of can we go and win, can we get as far as we can, and obviously lucky enough to get into the semi finals, and then we're lucky to get chaps in the semi final. Um, <laughs> So I think then it's just adapting to the game. So there were, there were periods we played very, and they got a goal back. It went two one, and we were playing a four one two three. So we were playing one set basically in four three three, and they were getting right on top of us. The fans behind them, 
really, really loud, great game to develop for all the players. So obviously we, we just changed it, we made a substitution, we probably took off one of our more attack minded players and went to two sitters at the base to send the flow through the middle of the pitch. We sent the flow for a little bit and the lad we brought on ended up scoring uh, from a ricochet in the box. But that would just be an example there where we're really looking at, at winning the game and how we can stem the opposition's flow to make sure that we get through to the next round. Whereas if that was a league game, for example, we might have been looking on how we can affect it so we can get certain players onto the ball more or to expose certain players one by one at the back. So I think that would just be a, a contrast of how we might have used different games last year to develop players. And what did you work on that in training then? Was that something that they, the boys are ready to go? You know, they, they were, was, that, was that quite a relatively simple tactical shift for the boys to make? Yeah, I think it was. I think we've played with a lot of flexibility in terms of formations this year. We've, we've, we've ranged from different variations of 4 3 3 to different variations of 4 4 2. So I think they were very comfortable and adept to, to make that. The biggest one that you want to see on the end is can they do it under the lights and under the pressure with, with the opposition fans? saying too much choice things to you and, and in a pressurised game. But I think we're allowed a fair bit of flexibility with our formations. And again, I think that is pivotal for developing players because if they go into the, the real world of football, they're going to play a range of formations, a range of different game styles under different managers. So I think we have to do our utmost to equip them for that, not just base it on how we see the game and the ideology of what we want to see in the game. We've got to prepare them for the, the real and wider world. And H, what about you? What what you what was what um what's it like? What's what's the tactical demands like here working with the fifteens and sixteens at Millwall and can you talk about any mid game changes that you've had to make? Um, I think work, you know, any work in sort of uh, within the younger ages, you're 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 also mindful of having that balance of getting the player minutes on the pitch, um, getting the minutes on the pitch in the in the the areas which you feel like they could potentially, you know, play um, as they get older. You want certain players to feel comfortable. They need moments where they're comfortable. You want to stress certain players out. And you want certain players to, to be learning. And I think certain players will need to be stressed out in order to learn. Others might need to feel comfortable in order to learn. So you may ask your wide players to cheat for 20 minutes and just stay high in order for your fullback to be exposed to 1v1s and 2v1 scenarios in order to see how they deal with that, how they, how well they can deal with that. So it's about exposure. Um, within those age groups, we also play the, the National Fundit Cup, um, which again, there's a little bit more emphasis on the result. Um, but again, I'm still looking at how, how we go about things, how we, how we play, what the style is. Um, just... There's, there's probably quite a few scenarios, but one of them one of them this year, we went and played one of the bigger boys away in the first game, um, and we were born at half-time. Um, and I, said, I just said to my players, because they, look, they were looking at me sort of shocked, and I just said to the players, I know how you feel now, I know you think, what do we do with 4-0 up, but just be mindful that the boys in the opposite dressing room have probably never been 4-0 down in their footballing careers. Um, and it's just about speaking about maybe playing uh, 10 yards deeper. Uh, space to be fine on the break. Uh, but that was the successful change that we made. And then there was a number of other successful changes that we tried to make. Um, again, it's, it's all about learning. We've been in younger age groups, so it is definitely trying to find a balance of of, of again helping the individual, but as you go up the ladder, up the pyramid, one of those changes to benefit the result, um, you've probably got to be a little bit more clear cut in what you do. What was that like for you, though, personally, as a coach? I mean, you know, most of the academy football is about development, you know, it's not necessarily about winning as much. I mean, a majority of clubs, and then suddenly you're in the Flood Lake Cup, like, or you're going to a European tour, and suddenly, you know, it, it's the you want to need the, you need the W, you need the win. What was that like you personally as a, you know, what sort of challenges was that like for you? Yes, yeah, it's, it's enjoyable. I mean, you've been there yourself, so when you go to the European tournaments or obviously, you know, you're playing in these national tournaments, um, you, sometimes you come up against clubs where you're expected to lose. So it's always an enjoyable scenario where you, you know that there may be a scenario tactically you might be able to um, address something in order to give your team the advantage. I... I I personally revel in scenarios like that. I really enjoy it. Um, so, really, really enjoyable process. Like you say, 
you know, the majority of the exposure I've had within academy football is purely development based, and we worry about the result as a secondary thing. After you know what the individual performance is like, who we have the best mm-hmm. player on the pitch, why was he the best player on the pitch, blah blah blah. Whereas that is, you know, you're coming away with the win, with the with the three points, if you like. So really, really enjoyable. And Gary, you, I mean, now obviously this is uh, this is where it really counts for you. Almost tactically, the pressure must be really high. Can you give us any examples of the tactical change you've 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 uh, you've made in the games? Uh, me personally, not very many. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, except obviously as a like I said, as with a, assistant, with, yeah. spoke of as well as assistant. I mean. He said as well his job was obviously not to maybe make the decision, but maybe to you know recognise where he can support the coach and telling them the manager and telling them maybe you know there's a this could be a change that we need to do. Yeah, yeah. The way we've we've got a staff of three assistant coaches and and the way we kind of work. Obviously, our, our head coach is you know he wants um, I suppose he wants suggestions and ninety nine point nine percent of of conversations during the game are tactical changes and tweaks. So when it comes to 60, 70 minutes, he wants um, either we're trying to close out a game, he wants a solution, or we're trying to chase a game, he wants a solution. So the way we use it on the bench almost is between the three assistant coaches. We'll probably start talking around the 45-minute mark, um, brainstorming, and using 15 minutes to give him two or three and kind of nail two. So when he when he looks for that, when he looks for those those suggestions we're not throwing 10 at him um, we're throwing two that we feel are good ones and then he he either decides to go with it or or decides to stay and and how much i mean i, I assume most of your the work you're doing in training is revolved around these sorts of that tactical flexibility yeah yeah towards probably i'd say it's more flexible at the start of the week because it's about ourselves and how we can become i suppose a little less predictable um, and, and then looking, you know, because we play one game a week, it means the scouting level is increases, the teams can prepare for it. And because there's only nine teams in our league, they can they can advance that scouting to prepare. So we would spend two, one to two days making sure that we're, you know, refining our system and maybe adding, a, adding something to it. And then the next two days of the week um, are spent in the preparation stages, looking at them and trying to prevent them from playing and, Difference in in possession and set pieces as well. So interesting. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Just want to think about um, how you guys deal with the maverick, uh, that player who's uh, got that something a little bit special, but maybe he's a bit high maintenance but low discipline. Um, what's your thoughts on a player like that? Someone who you know these the classic ones who can you know unlock a defence and do something magical, but maybe a bit more difficult to manage. H, what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, yeah, listen, I've worked with quite a few players like that, so you probably, you know, probably work with the same ones. To be fair, yeah, yeah. Um, I just, I think, look, when the player, when you when you're working with a player that has an extreme talent, an extreme ability, that's not normal. Um, you can't always expect them to be the most, you know, the most humble, uh, low maintenance. Um, person in the world I just think it's about just trying to trying to get that player on side trying to engage that player and also trying to enable them to be placed in the moment as many times as possible where where, where it's going to expose those talents um, I'm not I'm really not a fan of people that are, you know it's, it's my way or the highway and they try and suppress talents like that I think the best players in the world if we sit here and reel them all off now, they probably, when they get the ball, do exactly what they want, regardless of how they're supposed to play within a pattern, within a system, where they're supposed to stand out of possession, they'll do what they want. Um, and I think if you try and build around that, build in and around that, you're going to be more successful than if you try and suppress that player. Do you think there's a danger in academy football of you know trying to suppress individuality in favour of the uh, favour of the the masses if you like the team? Possibly, I think it's getting a lot better. I think it's getting a lot better. I'm, 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 I think I'm probably quite lucky. I'm 28, so I've come I've come through the newer generation, if you like. Where uh, I think it's getting a lot better. I think people's minds are open a lot more. I think you've just got to look at the players that we're producing nationally. 
Um, look at the boys that played in the 17 World Cup. Boys like Phil Foden, boys like Callum Hudson and Doyle. Um, players that, that you know we we work with so um, some of them are mavericks. Some of them are some of them are a little bit high maintenance. They want the attention. But the best attention you can have in football is when you've got the football. Everyone looking at you. That's the, that's where they relish. That's where they enjoy it most. Um, but in answer to your question, I do think we're we're getting better. We're being exposed to better education uh, on how to deal with how to deal with players who are at the extreme of that scenario, um, and not just because they're different, just pushing them away and being sort of. At arm's length, we're almost embracing it a little bit more because the best players that we've produced in this country have been Mavericks, and that's that's a fact. So, if we want more players like that, more match winners, then we need to learn to embrace it and learn to to, to help them harness their talents to go forward. And Gary, what's your thoughts on the, on the Maverick? Yeah, we, I think we're at a strange stage here in the US because I mean, cult, the culture word is is I mean, everyone I mean, I. I tweet about it no one's done myself as well so I'm probably part of the problem but it's almost that you want to create environments that teams and structures for teams to be successful but in doing that if the coach isn't aware enough you're almost creating a set of rules that that suppresses talent um, and doesn't allow people to flourish as individuals so I think the, the balance again that we talk about the balance from a coach has to be can I create the environment and the culture while allowing talent and people who are different to thrive and flourish and develop and grow, um, and that's where we're. Tr- I mean, I think the the biggest problem we have in the U.S. game is just finding difference makers, and people think that's that's a dribbler or something. But I think if you look at our cultures and our teams, um, maybe it's maybe it's socially tied together. Maybe it's the it's people that want to stand out socially. Maybe it's, there's that problem as well. But I think as coaches, we could do a better job of being aware that maybe we should be. We should be a little bit more accommodating. I think if a player kind of stands out and goes against the grain, we see that as a rule breaker, and we we want to clamp down on that. And we should be uh, giving those players a little bit more freedom to to challenge coaches as well. And I find that you know the the higher level of talent, there's no doubt the higher level of talent, the tougher the players should be to deal with because they see the game differently. And Carl, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I think. Uh, Harry made a great point there. I think you, you, you have to try and facilitate their needs. I said, but at the same time, as I think we've got to distinguish between if they're a, a maverick and a renegade, so to speak. I think if you've got a maverick and they can really buy into the team ethos and the team buys into them, then everyone's onto a massive winner and you facilitate and build the team around it. But when you've got individual personalities that potentially want to break up things and, and cause disharmony, I think that can cause you real problems, especially the higher the level you go in terms of when winning becomes more important. But I think in terms of the Maverick, and that's what I was talking about earlier, in terms of the tactical challenges, you've got to do everything you can to get them on the board as much as possible in the areas that they want to get on the board so that they're happy within the team. The team are happy because they're getting success from it at the same time. Um, and I, I, I tweeted about it earlier, I just, I just don't think there's as many around now. I think even they're starting to, to get back to it in terms of having those players that are different, and I think Mason Mann, for example, is absolutely outstanding having come up against him last year in the Youth Cup. But this World Cup, and I talked about it earlier, it's been all systems, possession. Whereas I remember as a 10 year old falling in love with the game of football at World Cup 98, watching Zidane, Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Laudrup was coming to the end of his career, Owen was breaking on the scene, uh, Romain still had Hadjit. There was endless ones. Colombia had Fowler Army. It was like every single team had a Maverick that you knew. I've got to watch these games today. Nigeria had a culture. Like you could just list a Maverick in every single team. And I don't know if it's just football and society in general is almost suppressing those real, real creative talents. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, and moving on, just a couple more questions. Uh, we've seen uh, like the re-emergence of uh, playing three at the back. Uh, what do you do to combat this? Did he come up against this? Um, so, Gary, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I just watched the game. Um, was it Croatia last night? Um, you know, in, in playing three at the back, if they're a possession team, they're always... You know, they're going to look at, at getting higher, getting their wing backs higher up the pitch. So, in transition, you're trying to work the ball and almost isolate the two wide def- the two outside defenders um, of the back three and create one v one opportunities. So, I think it's 
it's a test of how good you are in transition. And no one wants space. Like every every system against system is finding the weaknesses in that system, and then constantly stretching them. So what system? That, what system would you like to play against against the three at the back then? I'd go for width. You know, I'd go for I I go four three three and and almost cheat with the you know and, and take away the defensive responsibilities of the two. I think when we go for I think so many four three threes are turned into four five ones over here that I see. So it's almost like. Take the defensive responsibilities away from the two wide players. The centre forward then changes the point of attack, almost, uh, or sorry, prevents the switch. And then in transition, if you can play those two wide players, those two wide forwards in transition, you've got a chance of getting at them um, and turning them. Is that your favourite uh, formation, four three three? No, it's not actually. Uh, I like, you know. I, I like four four two. I like two two centre forwards playing off each other. I find it's easier to communicate the two lanes and, and to keep the discipline. I think it's harder to break them down. So I would I would be an old fashioned four four two man so. Nice one. And what about the, the uh, what about out of possession? You not you my uh, your midfielders uh, out of possession, what, what sort of uh, message you send to them? I mean I mean the uh, playing devil's advocate here, people are saying you might get outnumbered in the middle of the park. Yeah, yeah. I mean I either I either overcompensate the work of the of the weak side uh, wide player to tuck in, um, or the one of the forwards to just to drop off. And it's supposed to be a four four one one, um, or you know most teams. I find that that we we coach in fear too much. You know we worry about those three three v two overloads, but the majority of them are are number sixes who are just getting it off the ball back or getting it off the centre back and playing to the ball back. Yeah. So it's no one who, who you're up against. If that if that if those three are good, then yeah, I'm not going to play. But if those three are limited, then then I'll risk it. I thought it's interesting as well, and then maybe why we've not produced as many good strikers is maybe because we're not playing with two up top anymore that much anymore. Maybe it's quite interesting. What about you, H? What's what's your, why would you uh, combat playing a team against three at the back? And then what's your favourite formation? Um, loads of different ways. I, I think formations are like rock, paper, scissors. Everyone's got a strength and a weakness and you can combat one with the other. If you play two centre forwards against the back three, if, they, if they're starting position to correct and in between, they can freeze all three back players. So you, you're almost playing with a man extra and you can use your whip. If you're playing a front three, you've got the opportunity to either say to your seven and eleven, go and get chalk on your boots and go really wide and stretch it. Um, because the space is always going to be behind or in front of those two wing backs. Or you can ask your front three to go and play inverted and play 1v1 against them um, to really cause them a problem. So there's, there's lots of different ways. I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a preferred system because mine changes every year. If I've got, if I've got a set of players, if I've got this year within the APD college program, we've got four really, really good centre midfield players. So I'm probably going to play a box or a diamond. Um, last season, we had three centre-halves that I really like. We played a back three. We had two centre-forwards that are excellent. Rather than asking one of them to maybe play on the side of the pitch, I just try to go sort of round pegs in round holes, if that makes sense. Interesting, yeah. And Carl, what's your thoughts? What's, what's, how do you combat a back, playing against a back three? And then what's your, form, your favourite formation? Yeah, I think both Gary and Ange made some great comments there. I think... The two, again, it depends on your opposition, it depends on the strength of their team. I think the two up front can really stifle their three at the back, and then I'd probably play a diamond, obviously, depending on what their, their full backs will like, overload the centre of the pitch, and then depending on what my centre half so I look to um, their wing backs, sorry, not full backs, look to deal with crosses, so make sure they're not getting through the centre, the centre of the pitch and penetrating us. And then force them to cross with our full backs up against their wing backs playing one v one virtually would be a potential one. Um, and in terms of favourite slot, I'd have to agree with Pedro. I think it has to suit the players. It has to be down to what the players you've got at your disposal at the time. But if you got to, if you got to choose one, you know what would you do if you had you know your dream team out? What formation? My, my, dream, my dream team was probably Chelsea when they had. Therefore, their version of the four three three, where they had the six that had Essien going box to box, Lampard as a ten, two out and out wingers, and a centre forward like Didier Drop. That would be my my out and out. I think yeah. Nice. Okay, so uh, just coming towards the end, guys. I just want to ask you, what do you do uh, into? 
to to continue your own development and keep improving as a coach, Carl, what's what's you to, that question for you first? I think it's it's about going to see and, and researching best practice both in your own sport and and in other sports. Uh, so that's getting out there and going and seeing things that, on the cold face really, rather than just reading everything and and taking everything for granted that you read. It's, it's about getting out there and watching different practitioners work, seeing how they work, and then and then trying to use that for yourself. It doesn't mean copy, but I think. All the best coaches take little bits from everybody. So it, it's about getting out there and, and really seeing people work. And then on top of that, I think it's been really honest with your own self-reflections. I try and find times after session to both myself to reflect, but then with Steve Spooner, I'll work with to, to really get him to, to question what I'm doing and, and to um, bring the system with my own development. And, and so I think... Who would you, getting out there and seeing it, yeah. And who would you would you would you say were your some of the biggest influences in your career as a coach? Um, Steve Spoon, I just mentioned who obviously I've been working with with the eight teams and he his one wouldn't just be as a coach, I think he's really helped me as a person and, and made me see I was probably a little bit headstrong and a hundred miles an hour with everything very much in a rush. He's probably allowed me to understand football and the landscape of football and life and put a bit more long term perspective on things. And then two of us would be Richard Beale at the club, um, had a real good impact, a significant impact in terms of coaching capacity at, at Birmingham City, and, he, and he's an ever present for me to give me advice both on and off the pitch. And then our FA OECD we had, who's just recently moved to West Brom, Brian May, he's, uh, he's always there on the end of the phone, so I think he really understands me as a person, so I think he's managed to, to get me as a person, so I really seek his advice because I think he understands the way I think. and and act and behave so those would be the three and yeah I think it's vital vital that you have mentors both in football and, and off the pitch to, to help you on the way because it's it's a crazy game yeah and H what about yourself um, yeah really really similar to what Carl said I think you've got to get yourself out there um, we're lucky we're lucky now that with social media that you get to read loads of things see loads of video etc but I don't think there's anything better than looking at someone else's work, looking at it in the whites of their eyes and sort of analysing why they do what they do. I ask loads of questions, I try and use my ears as much as I can. Um, and just try, every club does something different, every coach does something different. Best thing, you know, best thing Carl said, Carl said then was the best coaches are the best thieves, and there's nothing wrong with that. So you just sort of take in little things that may suit you or suit your players and using it to your advantage, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And who would you put down as the uh, big influences in your career? Um, obviously, Michael Bill has been massive for me from sort of 15 all the way up to now. Um, and we're still really close. Bob Osborne at Chelsea was, was, was amazing for me. Um, he, he, was, he was really good. He was almost like a little bit of a nutty professor. Um, he's obviously coached the likes of John Terry's and Jody Morris's and even Peter Crouchy, so he's, he, he's got the T-shirt without a shadow of a doubt. Just some of the things that he would do, so forward-thinking with the younger ones. Um, so he was he was really good. And then again, one of the guys from the FA, Ben Bartlett, is outstanding. He always, always comes in and just and will, will help you find answers to questions about yourself. So those three would be sort of huge ones for me. And Gary, what's your, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think... Uh, Completely agree with with the two guys there. You've got to you know you've got to dedicate time time to it, and you've got to practice it. You've got to be intentional. I think about growth. I uh, don't find enough coaches are intentional about trying different things. Um, and then that awareness piece. I think uh, you know I interviewed Dean Austin um, for the podcast a, a couple of months ago, and he was he was talking about brain reflections every night, and I thought. And if you have a coach at that level doing that there, and how many coaches actually do that there, and something that I would like to promote a little bit more through through the work that I do, that coaches should be sitting and and maybe you know a bit more aware about where they are and where they're trying to grow and what they're trying to do. Because I think if you look at it, so many coaches go along just meander with what everyone else is doing, take the training sessions, do the sessions, think that it went well go in the game, win, lose or draw and go back and, and almost repeat, repeat, repeat. And, and I think we should, be, we should be a little bit more intentional about 
trying different things, connecting with players, what players have we not sold to. Um, we can help ourselves get more feedback rather than just relying on on defeats, bad times, or someone to come in and say, hey, that's not good enough. And who do you put down as your like, real main influences on your career? Uh, different stages. Like at, at, I've always, in a, in a college environment, I, I've always kind of gravitated towards people who are older coaches, so older basketball coaches or older coaches, experienced coaches um, at the school. So, and then it would be, and obviously from coming over here and playing in the college and then working with uh, a guy, working with Gary Hamill, that's who kind of gave me my start as a coach. So he was a mentor. And then, then it's almost now I'm always looking for different mentors at different sides of the game. If I want to, if I want to improve the tactical side of the game, I get a tactical mentor. If I want to improve the, my my business side of what I'm trying to do, I get a, I look for a business mentor. So it's just a case of being, I, I always use the term be intentional. And I find that that there cuts, I just want to save time. I'm the same amount of hours as everyone else has in the day. So I want to make sure that I'm not wasting that time trying to get something off someone who can't help me. And then always, and almost give them back as well. I think you owe it then, if I'm taking it from people, I owe it back then to put some stuff out. Um, so I think that's important for young coaches where they think that, they think networking is the same as as mentors. Like you're always constantly taking, but I think you have a you have a responsibility or an obligation to the community that if you're if you've got a mentor, you should be putting back in and, and letting people know your journey as well because that's the only reason that's the only way we're going to help the younger generation come through. Interesting. And then finally, last question, Gary, you go first. Uh, what what advice would you give to a up and young up and coming coach who wants to get involved in the elite game? Yes, study, uh, again, I think Carl said it there, study outside the game as well. So it's, uh, I'm kind of caught between whether you specialise in something or whether you just, you go for it and see where it takes you. Uh, but study, uh, practice, and then gain a reputation. And it's, again, it sounds like networking, um, but you've got you've to make your players better or you have to make them create an experience that they enjoy it and build a reputation for yourself around that there. So if you build a reputation, to me, that's the same as networking. And H, what's your thoughts? Um, my advice would be to, again, yeah, get out there, go and, go and throw yourself some new things. I'm, I'm, I'm massive as well. I think if you work hard and you're obsessed with something, you can, you can become better at it. So get up earlier than everyone else. Work harder than him, him, him and him and her. Um, and, and see where it takes you. I agree. I agree with, with what Gary said as well. You may not be able to find straight away where your where your speciality is, but I think it will find you off over time. So hard work and dedication would be the two things. And Carl? Yeah, I think the, the, the hard work to us. And I don't think you can miss the levels out. I think you really want to start right, right with grassroots, working in schools and really honing your skills as a coach to get people listening to all the basic, real basic skills of, of coaching and, and communicating before you even delve into all the tactical and all the technical. I think you've got to get the real basics in place for yourself first. And then I think be authentic. I think it's massive and you can almost go out on your own shield in that way that, that you're happy to go and be yourself on a coaching pitch, in a dressing room, in a coach's room, so that, you, that you're almost your own person, because I think for me, the people that really motivate me and inspire me are the authentic people that seem really genuine, and they are themselves. So I think it's easy in the coaching world to, to become a clone and, and, and totally copy other people or, or do what you must do to fit in or, or to, to save face, so to speak. But I think really be authentic. And then last but not least is, is persevere. And like I said, it's a crazy game. You don't know what's around the corner. You don't know what the next job opportunity is. You don't know what the next progression is. Or you don't know when, when the next bad thing can happen. So you've just got to keep persevering with it as well. Fantastic. Harry, Gary, Carl, thanks very much for your time. It's been fantastic. Uh, just finally want to say as well, good luck, H, getting married in a couple of weeks. So congrats, mate, as well. Cheers, boys. Cheers, Thank all. you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. 
Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game. 